everyone. Welcome to WonderCon. Um, today we're doing um, the panel called Creating Illustrated Books for Young Readers. And I'm Remy, and today I'm going to be the moderator. And we are here. Um, we're going, I'm going to introduce um, all the panelists um, in a minute, and then we'll go on to have uh, a conversation. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm Remy, and I'm an author and illustrator. And um, I have a graphic novel, um, a middle grade one, coming out in May called um, Picasso. And um, it is about uh, a dog, <laughs> which is based after my dog, um, who goes, uh, who carries a basket and goes um, shopping on his own. And here are some of the pictures there. And okay, it is based on um, partly on my dog, um, who loves to roll in poop. So here you can see the picture <laughs> after he's just rolled in poop. Um, and. And, and we are also here um, with Alana K. Arnold um, with her book, um, Star Lajin, and I'm going to let you let her um, talk about it now. Hi, ahead, thank you so much for including me in this panel. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so yes, I am the author, but not the illustrator of Star Lajin, which is a new uh, early chapter book, re early reader series, um, illustrated by the wonderful Anna Kang, A.N. Kang. Uh, so I just wrote the words and I'm in awe of those of you who can do both. Um, so Starla Jean, which came first, the chicken or the friendship is um, based as all of my work is in one or another way on real stuff. Um, so when I was, uh, I, when my, my kids were younger, my son um, went to the park with me and he saw a chicken at the park. Um, it's a weird thing to see at the park. It's a scrawny little chicken. And he asked me if he could keep it. And I said to him sort of with a throwaway offhand, if you can catch it, you can keep it. Uh, never thinking that kid would catch that chicken. Um, but here we are um, many years later, um, that chicken sadly is long gone, but the story stayed and turned into the basis of this whole series in which this young girl, Starla Jean has a dad who uh, doesn't think that she can do the thing that I didn't think my kid could do either. Um, so here's one of my favorite pictures of Starla Jean and, um, and the chicken who comes to be known as Opal Egg, which is also what my son really did name his chicken. I don't know where the name came from. He was only five, but Opal Egg it was, and Opal Egg she remained. Uh, so let's, let's see the next slide. You can see a little bit more art from Starla Jean. Oh, uh, one great thing about this series of books is in the back of the first one, uh, we have some chicken facts. Uh, and it was so much fun to research. You know, I thought I knew a lot about chickens from all our years of chicken ownership, but there was a lot I didn't know. Uh, one thing I did know, and maybe your kids don't, is that chickens can't get chicken pox. So uh, the art in this book is just absolutely charming. And it was, it was an interesting experience. It was like the illustrator reached into my brain and just um, knew exactly what I was thinking even better than I knew what I was thinking. And I think we have one more slide of Starla Jean content to share. Uh, <laughs> so here is the 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 moment where the dad um, the dad goes wrong. Um, he says, uh, "You've got to be smarter than the chicken, Starla Jean." Dad said in his teasing voice. He didn't seem to think I would be bringing the chicken home that day. Uh, and if you uh, are a parent of a kid, I think maybe one of the things we can all maybe learn a little bit is to never underestimate uh, a kid with a passion. So this is a great story. I think about. Um, about a kid who uh, gets what she wants. <laughs> I hope your kids will love it. Thanks for the Ilana. Next up, we have Catherine Applegate with Dogo and Pupper. You know, it's so funny listening to Ilana because I, so many of our experiences overlap. I have always been an animal lover too, and I worked for a vet in high school. And I feel like almost all my books have animals in them one way or the other. But um, Doggo and Pupper started out actually as a rhyming picture book called Old Dog Takes a Road Trip. And thank goodness for editors. My wonderful editor, Liz Zabla, suggested turning it into an early chapters book in prose. And there was so much more room for humor that way. Um, and then of course, when you add an illustrator as fantastic as Charlie Alder, it's, it, just, it just came alive. So um, it was a work in progress. And I think sometimes um, kids, when they're working on their stories or aspiring 
authors forget that uh, stories evolve and they can take quite a while. In this, in this case, uh, it took many years. So um, I, at the time I, I began this, I had uh, an old dog and a younger puppy and a very old cat and a kitten. And watching them interact was, you know, both frustrating and hilarious. So I, I wanted to kind of riff on that about that generational divide. And in Doggo and Pupper, and this is a, actually a trilogy, um, in the first book, Doggo's kind of set in his ways. He's an older guy, he has a routine and his humans decide to spice things up a little with a new puppy. There's also a rather sardonic cat who lives in the household and provides commentary occasionally. So there's a lot of adjustment to be done as there is when you bring any, anyone into a household, uh, be it a, a grandparent or a new baby or a kitten. And it was really fun to explore that. So um, uh, as you can see, life with Pupper was not boring. Um, Remy, do you wanna switch over to the next? illustration. Um, this is where um, Pupper, who's had some issues in the household, is sent to charm school. And he learns to sit, and he learns to stay, and he learns to come, and he becomes almost too good a student. And uh, Doggo has to come along and kind of ease him back into puppyhood. So uh, what I loved, and, and I know, um, for those of us who are not illustrators, this, this experience is so cool. You send out this manuscript and then, you know, the art department and editorial sort of um, play matchmaker. And when I saw the early drafts of, of Charlie's illustrations, it was like the book had just tripled in content in, the, in terms of humor. It's just, you know, a little eyebrow twitch or a little, a little shrug from Pupper and, and the scene changes. So that has been an absolute delight. And I think kids are really gonna, really gonna love the illustrations, so. Oh, we've got one more. I forgot about that one. Um, this is uh, right before they go on a bit of an adventure. And, we, and it's, a, it's a funny thing with, um, with any books that involve uh, animals, there's always that question about how far to anthropomorphize. In my case, I decided what the heck, Doggo grabs the keys and road trip. And um, uh, the great thing about readers these age is they'll totally buy it. So, um, so that was a lot of fun. It gave, gave me more mileage as it were. So um, I really hope kids will enjoy it. Thanks, Rin. Thanks, Catherine. I was wondering, is, is there a cat who is not sardonic? <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have um, Dan and Jason with blueberry and pancakes. Hey, everybody. Yeah, um, I'm Dan. I'm Jason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we have a story that's called Blueberry and Pancakes, which is about um, three best friends who live in this tree together. And um, the story is kind of about it's a series, it's an uh, early reader graphic novel. And um, this story and the following stories are kind of all about like how to be a good friend and about like what makes an enduring friendship. Um, real quick, I just wanna say thanks for inviting us to be part of this and feels like we're in really good company. Like both these other books just look absolutely amazing. And we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet you guys and get to talk a little bit about Blueberry and Pancakes. Um. Um, yeah, I think it's funny as we were working on this story together, you know, Dan and I go way back. <laughs> like we've been friends since high school um, and we're both like dads with kids now. So we've kind of gotten to share a lot of major life <laughs> uh, adventures together. Um, but I feel like we didn't really figure this out when we were working on it, but Dan and I, after college, we went to um, Brooklyn and we lived in this like renovated coffin factory. Like <laughs> they, they literally used to make coffins there. And, and we had this rotating roommate, you know, it was, it was a three bedroom apartment. And it was this kind of magical time in your life where you're not sure like what your life is gonna turn into or where you're gonna go, but you have all these like big ideas and all these kind of fun adventures you go on. So I don't know, somehow Blueberry and Pancakes kind of tap into that nostalgia for us, but also like that kind of like, um, that kind of magical time when you're like, your life isn't set <laughs> and you're, 
um, you're just, you're kind of leaning on your friends for everything, right? It's like your friends share all your adventures and you're, you need like hugs sometimes. Sometimes you need your friends to laugh with you or, you know, sometimes you need your friends to listen to you. So <laughs> all of those kind of like life lessons we learned when we were in our late, mid to late twenties are kind of like inside this tree with these three characters. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Raymond, you mind switching to the next slide? Um, yeah, I feel like actually, yeah, Jason totally nailed it. It's like, um, it's almost like after you, you know, go to college and graduate and kind of start your life, like you kind of create a new family with your friends. And it's like being a good friend, it, it takes work, you know, and like there's kind of like some lessons that you have to learn in terms of, and that's I feel like for like little kids and older kids and grown ups, it's like, it's, um, you know, it's like, sometimes it's not easy to be a good friend. And, and, just, uh, and just to tell you a little bit about the characters too. Um, so Blue is this earthworm and he's, you know, he's kind of a book, he's kind of a bookworm. It, it kind of like that part kind of really just seemed to make sense. Um, and he lives on the basement cause he likes being near the dirt and stuff. And he's got this comfy chair and his whole thing is he loves like reading about stuff. He's kind of one of those people that kind of prefers to experience life through books. <laughs> and then, um, I don't know, Dan, do you want to talk about Barry? I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. So Barry is this green frog and he's like really studious and is kind of all about like plans and making things. And like, he likes, he keeps this little sketchbook that he's like always like coming up with like notes and coming up with schemes. Um, and in, in his whole thing, he's a little bit of a control freak too. And he really likes to think of himself as the brains of the operation, but it doesn't always work out that way. And then pa Pancakes is really fun too. She kind of just lives in the moment. She's like this big, super surprisingly strong bunny rabbit who loves to dance or make up, make up dances. Like in one episode, she's like roller skating with hula hoops. So she kind of has all these silly ideas and is always coming up with stuff that's totally spur of the moment. And it's like Barry is always like planning and he wants to draw it out and has blueprints all over his room. But <laughs> Pancakes is just like, turn the music up and let's dance. Let's just have fun. So she really lives in the moment, which is, um, it's an inspiring way to live. I kind of wish <laughs> I could be a little bit more like pancakes sometimes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Remy, do you want to jump to the last one? Yeah, it's almost like, um, it's funny. It's like blueberry and pancakes have become our friends, but I feel like they also kind of like represent certain parts of our own personality. You know, it's like blue is kind of the heart. Like he's like all like emotion and like feelings and, Barry is kind of the brain where he's all like analytical and then Pancakes is like the body where she's like physical and fun. But in this story, they go on this adventure where um, they decide to go to the beach and Blue brings this like really special beach ball that's like part of his ball collection and he doesn't want anyone to play with it. But then Barry and Pancakes use it without his permission and it just explodes into this totally insane high stakes adventure where they have to like get this ball back. But it all comes We're back to... I was just going to say, if, if the book, you know, somehow ends beach ball theft, then it's a success. Like, that's kind of what we're, <laughs> that's what we're going for on some level. Beach ball theft. Yeah. And it's funny. It's like, and that's how a lot of these stories work. It's like, it starts off as like this small little friend conflict and then explodes into this totally insane adventure and then comes back to like really what it's all about, which is friendship. Yeah. It seems it's like you maybe have like an... Oh. I was to say, it seems like maybe you have like an id ego, super ego set up here. <laughs> Top yeah, down. Yeah, totally. It's like Kirk's super ego on the right? closest to city earth, which is kind of interesting. You yeah. think of the super ego living in the top story, but you've uh, flipped it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's like, this is totally like, you know, like our target age is like, you know, four to eight or something like that. You know, it is an early rear thing, but it's like, but Jason and I really write stories for us that we like, we're trying to entertain each other, you know? And so it's like, I feel like there are kind of like layers to it that grownups can enjoy and it's, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Remy. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, earlier, Dan and Jason, you were saying you lived in a coffin factory and you had a rotating roommate. I was, I, I thought, I thought you meant literally like an exorcist kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was this like, it was this old factory in Brooklyn, in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And they used to make these pine coffins. And it's, when we first moved in there, they were still making coffins. And then they kind of phased that out. And they actually built our apartments out of old like pine wood. So it was just like, there was kind of like a creepy, cool element to it. But it was, I don't know, it was wild. It was fun.
And all, yeah, and just real quick, like all of our beds were like lofted and, and Dan, for some reason, Dan kind of got the worst room, right? Like when there's three rooms in an apartment, there's always one room you really don't want. But he made this like little crawl space with a window because there's like a tiny little window in this pretty big room. But so his bed was almost a coffin size. <laughs> so he would crawl out. sleep like this. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was pretty funny. But it was, it was great. It was, you know, you're, you're young and it's kind of like, you don't really need that much sleep. Not like you do when you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, this is something that I'm really curious with, uh, uh, curious about. So since I'm the author and illustrator, so I kind of get full control of a lot of things. Um, uh, for Picasso, um, I have a colorist. Uh, the name is Sam, Sam Bennett. Um, but for um, and for Dan and Jason, you work really closely to create the whole book. And then for um, Catherine and Ilana, uh, you you're both um, the authors, and then the illustrator is someone else. Um, so I was wondering, what was the collaboration process like? Um, Alana, do you want to go first? Yeah. So for me, um, I I don't I didn't know when I wrote the book who was going to illustrate it. I didn't. I think that's pretty normal with uh, sort of traditionally published uh, works of fiction, um, both picture books which I've done and chapter books. Uh, I don't I don't know who's going to illustrate the book. I sell it to the to the you know to the publisher, find an editor who has a vision for who, you know, what they think the look should be. And I'm not a big believer in giving art notes. Um, I think that um, the, the text itself should have everything it needs for the, uh, you know, for, except for the, the occasional uh, joke that has to play with, you know, an illustration and there's no room for it in the text. I really think of it as sort of a, um, a marriage between the, the work of mine and the work of the artist. And I don't wanna direct the artist with my, you know, with my work. So I had no idea what this was going to look like uh, until I saw the first sketches. Um, there was really no um, conversation at all between me and the artist until after the book was finished. Um, so mostly it was it's sort of a, like a trust fall, you know, uh, <laughs> that you put, you put your best work out and then you trust that the artist will catch you and and make it better in ways you can't anticipate. And it has been, it, it really, it's like this, it's this incredible gift that someone is willing to spend their time and their energy on um, in collaborating. It becomes, even though you don't talk to each other, it is this sort of collaboration. Um, I had, I heard an artist once tell me that she doesn't like it when uh, writers expect her just to be the wrist, which I'd never heard that term, but I guess that's an artist term, you know, like draw this, draw that, you know? Uh, as opposed to thinking of the artist as an equal partner in in um, in the in the work, so that's been such a gift to me to to see the work that Anna has done for all three of the books in the series. And so I'm curious. So do you before they before the publisher chooses an illustrator? Do you have a maybe do you, do you have did, did they ask you like are, yeah. are there any illustrators you have in mind? Yeah, sometimes they ask that. More often, they'll they'll give you like three or four illustrators that they were considering that they in the art department have decided would be good choices for you and your work. Maybe people they've worked with or people whose books they already admire and they feel like will be a tonal match for your words. And then you um, you know tell them if you have opinions um, who you hope that they'll sign up. And in this case, uh, Anna was my first choice out of the the names that were floated to me. Uh, so I was thrilled when her. And then sometimes it's not even that they don't like your book if they can't take it as artists. No they have busy schedules too. So it really is about if they're available and if they have time in their schedule and how, how long the project will take. So yeah, I was really lucky that the first artist on the top of our list was available. What about you, Kathy? Uh, very similar. Again, I, you know, it's, it's funny, the, um, the collaborative part, I think, I believe Charlie uh, actually lives in the UK. Uh, and I've had illustrators who've lived all over the world and sometimes you, you do interact and, and, but I think more often than not, it's your um, art director is sort of the intermediary and it's like, it's, you said marriage, it's kind of like long distance dating where, you know, you, you'll get a sketch and um, almost invariably you go, oh, I can't believe how cool that is. Um, sometimes you, you'll think of a tweak um, or you'll remember that there was a teddy bear in the corner of the room and you'll suggest that. But I, I find, um, especially because illustration is just not something I, I get or can do, 
um, that I readily defer to uh, the artist and they always come up with things that I would never have dreamed possible. A lot of times it has to do with, oh, maybe an, an inset with or a use of white space um, or a, a sequence that you wouldn't have thought, you know, you've written a sentence and suddenly it turns into an entire page, you know, with sequenced actions. And I just don't think that way. So every time a sketch comes through or a cover or the finished product, it's like, you know, Christmas and your birthday rolled into one. It's, it's, it's so exciting. And it's like, you're harmonizing with someone you can't see. It's a very mysterious kind of, um, intimate process that it's, I, I don't know how they do it. Um, but like Alana, I, I sort of feel like, you know, I've done my little part. There are my little words on the page and um, you know, now it's yours. So are, are there like any, any instances where let's say the illustrator says, oh, let's take out this sentence and I can convert that into a picture. Are there any ever, ever any instances of that? It seems to me that's, that happened to me once in a different book where it was actually the editor who suggested it and, and it improved it. I mean, the, the funny thing about writing at this level is it's, it's poetry. I mean, you know, every word counts. I mean, you know that with, with your own work. And so, um, so if there's a way to take out a word to, to simplify and give the illustrator more room, yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah, right. I've had that same experience. It's yeah. pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we don't need these words anymore because the illustrator did such a great job here that we actually yeah. can take this out now. Mm -hmm. mm, great. And so for Dan and Jason, so for me, when I work with uh, my illustrator, I don't actually communi communicate directly with her. It's always through my editor. So I guess that that minimizes any potential conflict. I think that's the reason. <laughs> so, but you, Dan and Jason, you work so closely together. What about if you disagree? Like you come to a fist fight? <laughs> <laughs> Everything's arm wrestle. We just arm wrestle. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. We actually don't disagree that often. Um, it's like we've been working together for so long. Like Jason and I started drawing comics and making stories and doing projects together back in high school. Um, and we've been working professionally for, you know, 20 years together um and it's it's funny it's but it's actually a kind of similar process to what you guys are talking about which is like jason's literally he's like one of my favorite illustrators like i just he's actually he's amazing so it's like i get to work with this guy that i, I love his work and he's he's also an amazing writer so so funny so it's like it is kind of this thing where it's like you know, we pass stuff back and forth and he'll have ideas on how to make stuff better or sometimes i have ideas and make stuff better and we'll you know, write in, like, we write in the same document, and sometimes we'll draw on the same drawing, and it just kind of is this great, you know, it's like a, I don't know, like a duet or something. <laughs> it's like, you know, I feel like one, uh, one way it, it feels like it works for us is, like, if you ever go on a trip, and you're, like, in a new city with somebody, and you want to go see, like, the piazza or something, there's, the, you have a goal, but you don't know the city, you don't speak the language, and you're like wandering around. So Dan and I both usually, like we started a story like Blueberry and Pancakes, and we want like, we want to have a story about friends that live together and they get into adventures. And like, that's the goal, but how to get there. Sometimes it's like, I'm pretty sure we got to go down this alley, Dan. And Dan will be like, no, 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 it's faster to go this way. So I think those are the arguments. And, and usually I'll go, I'll be like, no, no, we got to go down this alley and it'll be a blind turn and Dan will be right. And we have to like back up the car and go the other way. But it's kind of like we're always, you know, we're always in it together. Like that's that's never like the issue. It's just which way are we going to go to get to where we want to be. But um, also the other thing I think that's helped Dan and I work together is we come, we kind of, our part of our, our professional life has been in animation. And animation is, um, it's an awesome like hybrid of filmmaking and illustration. And it's like, you bring your drawings to life and it's it's so much fun, but it's also super collaborative, like filmmaking, like a film set. It's like there's, animators and storyboard artists and there's coppers and cg artists so there's all these people like working together so we're we're not like the we're we've never really creatively worked where we kind of go into a tower and like stephen king just like cook up a story in your head as thunder is crashing outside we're, we're always kind of like in this workshop throwing ideas around so it, it feels like we don't always know where we're headed but it's you know we kind of trust ourselves enough to like figure it out on the way i guess that's cool. Uh, okay. 
Let's see. So, and um, all our work uh, features animals. Um, so how did you make those choices? So for me, um, I, I got to writing a dog book simply because my, my editor um, knew that I love dogs. Uh, my Instagram page is just all pictures of my dogs. And so he asked me to write a dog book. So that's how I came to write a dog book. And I, I really like animals. So yeah, I love writing about them. But what about um, your, how did you make, um, decide to um, write about animals? And how do you think um, animals are, why do you think it's so important um, in books for younger readers? Uh, I'll be Catherine. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's funny, I'm, I've been going through a dog phase because I did the three dog and pupper books and then I did a, a series about uh, more high middle grade uh, level called Endling about um, the last animal in a species that happens to look a whole lot like a talking Labrador. And I've just, I've been in, in dog mode for a while now, but I, you know, I love them. And I think um, I, I can remember being a kid and just staring at my dog and wondering what they were thinking. And somehow that, that fascination has never really gone away. But I think for kids, because they're, they're very vulnerable and they're surrounded by all these, you know, tall humans telling them what to do. I think they relate well to animals. And the other side of the coin is that they can care for them and they can provide, you know, structure and love and all the things that parents do for them. And it, it's, it's a unique opportunity to, you know, see both sides. So I think animals are wonderful surrogates in children's books. Awesome. Uh, let's go to Dan and Jason. Yeah, I mean, our characters are um, almost completely anthropomorphized, like they're pretty much people, you know, but I still think that there is something interesting, like where animals, like the design of an animal and the shape of an animal is something that's kind of easy for us and I think for kids to like imprint on. It's almost like you can like, they kind of create this like, I don't know, this icon or this vessel that you can put yourself in in a really easy way. Um, and so I don't, there's something about it that just is like, it lends itself to characterization and creating characters for interesting stories. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of what Catherine was saying, it's like, I, I feel like I've, I had a cat that I totally love named Caesar. And I was like, what is he thinking? And me and my wife would like pretend we knew what he was thinking and <laughs> we would talk for him, which is kind of like something crazy you probably wouldn't do around, you know, people you don't really know that well. But I feel like kids don't have that filter, right? It's like, the whole world talks for kids. Like my, when I drive my daughter to school, she like starts having her mittens talk to each other. And, and I think animals are so personable and they, you know, kids see animals as being not that far away from people at all. Like there's no boundary, right? So of course they should talk just like people talk. And, and, all, and also, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Calvin and Hobbes and Tintin. And those both had great animal companions that were like as important as the rest of the characters in the story, which I think is a great message for kids too. It's like animals are super important and they belong in the stories that we tell because they're important. <laughs> so so you, you mentioned that blue is a worm uh, because it just made sense. What about uh, berry and pancakes? How did you decide that they're a frog and a bunny? Well, it's funny. It's like, I, I feel like when we were designing these characters, we were kind of just coming up with like fun shapes and shapes that we felt like reflected their um, personalities. And it's like, when we were first drawing Barry, it's like he was, he's really, he's like, he's almost just like a face. He's like this little rectangular face. And it just kind of like, I think one thing kind of feeds the other, like his design and the fact that he's a frog starts to feed his personality. And like, that's how you develop his personality. And then vice versa. It's like when we started to figure out like, oh, he's all about plans and schemes and, you know, figuring stuff out like that ends up kind of st starting to affect his design. And it's like both things kind of go hand in hand. I have a theory about your animals. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to me that Barry is the frog and frogs are, are dual nature, right? Because they're like water animals with no arms and legs and then they turn into uh, legged you know, air breathing animals. And to me, that's your ego character. Uh, so it's the bridge between the, the id and the superego. Um, but again, you have it reversed because the worm you would think of as the, 
the lowliest, right? It's a, it doesn't have, it's an invertebrate, it doesn't have arms, and yet it's sort of the superego of the story in a way, uh, versus the, uh, the id, which is the most, or, which is the most uh, mammalian of your animals, the closest to us, and maybe the closest to children, right? Sort of uh, wanting to do the immediate thing. Um, anyway, I don't know. But no, I, 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 that's great and it's funny too because there's something about barry too where he's like he is like the ego too where he's like constantly striving it's like i feel like he's the one who really like is like trying to reach for i don't know greatness or like ambition or something like yeah. that where like um blue is just kind of like happy in his like in his like little creature comforts and pancakes is just kind of like in the moment you know what I mean she's right. just kind of like cool doing what so no I think there is like there's like a weird there's like a psychological subtext happening there is <laughs> and writers do that even if they don't know because like you think too about the names not to belabor the point but uh pancake is a physical uh thing to enjoy right and uh Barry is a human name you don't spell it like Barry so it's it's he does seem to be the stand-in for the sort of average average joe and then blue is well, well i mean it's a color so it's an abstract thing more like the super ego so yeah that's what i know like. <laughs> and blue is also a, a feeling right it's like yeah <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> what about you Ilana? what about um opal egg yeah so opal egg is completely not anthropomorphized in fact i tend i realize to write animals that are animals um so I wrote a series called A Boy Called Bat uh, about a little kid who is autistic who becomes enamored with an orphan skunk and he becomes determined to keep in care for the skunk. The skunk is a skunk is a skunk. It doesn't become, you know, anything else. It doesn't talk to him. Um, he doesn't even imagine that it talks to him. And Opal Egg too is, is a chicken. She wants the chicken because it's a chicken. And the, I did notice that the artist did this really one wonderful thing. Well, the artist does a few things that anthropomorphize the chicken. Um, in the... Um, at the end in the chicken pictures where the chicken, you know, where I give you the chicken facts, um, we do have an anthropomorphized chicken where we have the chicken like drawing pictures, drawing, you know, doing math, because chickens can do math. So she does get become a little bit fantastical there, which I think was a really, uh, a really smart decision. But there's also um, a part here that the artist did that I didn't really see how smart this was. This is when the artist adds things that you don't know. So here I have, um, Starla Jean with her chicken, you can't really see because it it's in the border. And we have a mom with her baby. And I never really thought that Starla Jean would feel a sort of a little bit of jealousy over the mother and the baby. But I do have Starla Jean diapering the chicken later using one of Willa's diapers, the babies. And so the, the artist has done this wonderful thing of creating subtext about like, why does she need this chicken? Maybe partially because her mother has this new baby. So, which is totally never mentioned in the page and wasn't even on my mind as a writer, but it's the beautiful work of partnership that the illustrator saw something there that I didn't and created that depth. So um, I love anthropomorphized animals, but I realize that I tend not to write them uh, I, in general, although I do have one sort of anthropomorphized sort of mythical creature in my next book. But uh, in general, my animals are, are, are actually, you know, not anthropomorphized. And I love that there's, that's why I think it's so great that we have so many books that all these different ways to interact with animals. Thanks for that. Um, and we have time maybe to uh, just quickly tell um, everyone what what are you working on right now? Um, go ahead, Catherine. Um, well, I have two more, Doggo and Puppers, coming out. The next one is Doggo and Puppers Save the World. And the third one is Doggo and Pupper and Cat's Bad Bed. Um, so Cat plays a major role in that one. Um, I also have a middle grade fantasy, I guess you'd call it, coming out with a sort of ecological theme uh, this fall called Willadine, and I'm very excited about it. It's uh, the cover is by and, and spot illustrations inside are by uh, the amazing Charles Santoso, who did uh, my book Wish Tree. And it's about two um, really intriguing animals. Uh, neither of which you've ever seen before. My, my favorite being, uh, they're called humming bears and they're little bears that fly uh, and nest in blue willow trees and their nests are created with uh, glistening clear bubbles. And they migrate each year to a little town and uh, there have been some ecological changes and I have to, it's a, it's a little bit of an ecological mystery, but also I think very much about um, friendship and, you know, our, 
our interactions with the world at, at large. Oh, I can't wait to read that. Charles Santoso is amazing. He illustrated my bat books too. Oh, um, no, he's so good. Yeah. Yes. yeah, he's great. What are you working on now, Ilana? So Starla Jean has two follow-ups. Uh, the second one is uh, Starla Jean, um, gosh, no, wait, wait, wait. Starla Jean uh, bakes a cake uh, and she's waiting for uh, Opal egg to lay an egg. Um, there's an egg, but a cake. So antics ensue. I, a watch chicken never lays. <laughs> and then the third one will be called Starla Jean Cracks the Case. Uh, and like yours, Catherine, a little bit, it expands the world a little bit. Characters who were introduced in this first book briefly come back in, this, in the third book. Uh, and then I also have this book coming out at the end of March. So just in a month from you know, when we're recording this channel, it's called- so Beautiful. I'm Thank sorry. you so much, Catherine. I'm so glad you love it. It's called The House That Wasn't There. And I think this uh, as a gently magical exploration of the things that connect us, even if we can't see them. And this one does have, uh, it does have something of, a, of an anthropomorphized character in a, a taxidermied opossum named Mort, <laughs> but it also has two kittens. Uh, so I hope you guys will look for the house that wasn't there. It comes out on March 30th. I'll wait awesome. to read that. What about uh, you, Dan and Jason? Well, all that sounds awesome, by the way. Those books sound so cool. I can't wait to check those out. Um, yeah, so the first Blueberry and Pancakes um, comes out March 9th, so just in a couple weeks, and we're really excited about that. And then we actually have two more Blueberry and Pancake books coming out. Um, the second one is called um, Escape from Balloonia, which is um, about Blueberry and Pancakes get trapped on um, a balloon planet and have to figure out how to get home. <laughs> and the third one is... Um, called Danger on Mount Chaco, which is um, they have to uh, scale a really tall mountain to find this secret thing. Um, that's also a big fun adventure story. <laughs> and then we're also working on um, a, a slightly older group, um, a kid, like a young, <laughs> I guess a young graphic novel for like eight to 12 called Barb the Last Berserker which Dan, I have all this like X-Men and He-Man and Transformer knowledge we thought we'd never get to use, but we're getting to put it into this awesome story. It, it follows this young girl. She's like 11 years old named Barb and she's the last of this brave group of berserkers that kind of saved the world. And she gets a magical sword and she kind of has to like save her world, but she also meets this guy who's a Yeti, who's, his name's Porkchop and it's kind of a buddy comedy. There's a lot of, fun in it and there's also this scary bad guy named witch head so that, that'll be super fun it's 250 pages so it's like <laughs> kind of made our heads explode trying to get it all on the page but um it's been super fun working on that too that comes out in end of september wow all those books i need to read them <laughs> remy what do you have on the on the on your list what's coming out next for you um, so Picasso comes out in May, um, which is, is a middle grade graphic novel. And then next year I have a series of three books. They are young reader graphic novels about, um, uh, about animals who, who, whose lives are affected by uh, man-made um, environmental changes. So um, the first one is about an elephant. The second one is about a koala. And then the third one is a shark. <laughs> really excited for that one. Oh, that sounds okay. wonderful. Yeah, I'm having so much fun drawing it. Um, and I think that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much for, um, for coming here and talking about all your wonderful books. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks, that was awesome.